Oh, can you start at the beginning, Andy? Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll just make it full screen and then I'll go backwards. Presentation. So is that the first, you should be, yeah. you see the first slide, so yeah. And yeah, that's, that's fine, the that's next fine. Slide. And I'll, I'll just give you a, a next slide when I want yeah. the next one. Okay, so I've got just 10 minutes and I pride myself on never speaking longer than I'm invited for. So. Um, hopefully that'll work out. And I was wanting to say it's really good to have this opportunity to contribute to forging a culture and, art, and arts policy framework for West Yorkshire from the bottom up. Um, just a couple of sentences about who I am before I draw on my own research evidence to demonstrate that vats of creative potential are wasted when top downers have their way. So I'm an independent researcher. My doctorate was, is in the, uh, was in the interrelationship between artists' livelihoods and arts policy. And this followed on from many years of immersion in the visual arts as an artist and researcher. And until six years ago, as someone running an arts council funded artist centered organization. Next slide. So these are the questions that top-down arts policy makers never seem to ask when they're forecasting and forging arts infrastructures. I'm talking in this presentation particularly about visual artists, but in fact um, you could transfer the notion of looking at a particular individual group and uh, in this way to all sorts of other sets of individuals in arts and culture practitioners and communities of interest concerned with play, literacy, health, well-being, etc. So what do they actually need to have you ask them, but please don't ask them in any more surveys. What are their nuanced attributes and contributions as people and professionals, the tangible and the intangible? In the case of visual artists, I found that little attention is paid to these kind of questions because in a trickle down arts economy that we've had for the last 30 years, artists have become treated as transactional, tra transactionally. Their sole value about what they can do to bolster the status and business models of organisations hiring them. Next slide, please. So of course the perspectives differ. The actual creators of the visual arts that arts organizations rely on to get the money spending audiences in have consistently come last in policy because, because artists' perspectives are missing in how policy is made and that therefore how the delivery mechanisms and the success criteria are formulated. And it's been exactly the same in the COVID emergency. There's been a lot of generalizations. The C one CEO in an event I zoomed into recently extolled the plucky artists who just roll up their sleeves and get in there with communities and keep things moving. And then in another uh, set of material I looked at, it was artists, particularly those who were disabled, who showed immediate leadership in the cultural sector in modeling effective home working, self care, and innovative creative solutions, all on no money. It's a miracle. Um, about three quarters of visual artists weren't eligible for Arts Council or government emergency funding because of self-employed, because of the 50% rule. But if there is a genuine interest in enabling artists to do what artists do, with whom they ever do, they do it so that their benefits accrue to people around them over a life cycle. Policy really does need to capture the artist's perspective, their social reality, their beliefs and values, their characteristics and creative behaviours, and understand how, how these benefit society both directly and indirectly. Next slide, please. So this is my formula for artists' livelihoods. You could look at, in a sense, making a formula for other kinds of things that you're wanting to achieve, but I look particularly at this. Um, there are three core conditions that give artists what I call volition. So creative space, which is a mixture of headspace and time that builds artistic acuity, tacit knowledge and the confidence to act. 
there are situated practices that locate what and who artists are and generate a sense of belonging, which is supporting, supportive of their well-being over a lifetime. But last but not least, there are negotiated relationships. And this is the crucial ingredient that's missing from other formulations and indeed from the way that arts policy and institutions perceive artists. These are the means for co-development and co-validation. This latter is necessary for the power transfers first, that I'll talk about in a minute. I'd argue, and hopefully this think tank to develop policy from the bottom up, relevant to the specifics of place, people and time, we'll put this to the test. That if you want a sound, progressive, big picture, you need to start with the very small detail. You need to look carefully at how to nurture the talents and capacities of what Charles Ledbetter called the arts pebbles. Unlike the boulders, and I'm using boulder with a U in there, arts organisations, we can see that those are now floundering all around us. But the pebbles, the artists, the individuals, are the most adept at dealing with external shocks and knocks. Next slide, please. COVID has put a harsh spotlight on the baseline flaws in the ecology and infrastructures for the contemporary visual arts, and in fact, in a lot of the infrastructures that surround us at the moment. It's not just the visual arts. Most opportunities for artists really aren't opportunities much at all. Artists aren't sitting in appreciable numbers around the Zoom tables devising and modelling the reset that will supposedly put everything back on an evening, even keel for the decade ahead. In a trickle-down arts economy, it's artists who just keep losing out because something, almost anything else, is always far more important. Next slide, please. We already know from a, a copious amounts of research that the insidious club culture of the arts and creative industries is very bad for freelance artists and creatives. This scant regard for equanimity in a funded art in, in structure, reliant on the surplus value derived from artists as their primary means of subsistence, but without demonstrating any duty of care for them. Providing economic, emotional and social well-being for a vital constituency in the visual arts, the artists, needs more than a bit of a tweak. I don't think that equity will be achieved by looking to those working in existing hierarchies. There are too many vested interests at play. And institutions and their top teams always see to see, seem to see themselves and their posts as front and centre of any solution. In my mind, it's a reboot that's needed to affect the necessary transfers of power and radically redefine what just has to be saved at all costs. Remedies designed to deliver human thriving in the arts and culture are not, are, are not cosmetic, but structural. And there's three operating principles for those. First off, there's the diversification of arts policy that puts the focus on enabling divergent communities of interest, including artists, to engage directly with the what, why and how of local provisions. Secondly, there's democratising arts development, so moving debate and decision making about the why, what and how in the arts and culture to the grassroots. And thirdly, there's the devolution of funding giving artistic and economic responsibility to accountable localised infrastructure. So making strategic and long-term shifts away from the current urban and London-centric perspectives. And here I would agree with Ben Cooper's recent report for the Fabian Society, in which he talks about putting local authorities in charge, although I don't agree with his view that the Arts Council is the indispensable expert partner in any new framework. Next slide, please. But I have to say, and I'm glad to say, that I'm not unique in the assessments that I'm bringing, so I wanted to end up by mentioning some of the others that are paving the way for unprecedented change in arts and culture. So Rewild the Arts, do have a look at it. Um, it's very active on Twitter. 
and it's focused on reimagining the cultural sector's future ecology with artist welfare at the heart of discourse around inclusive alternative radical strategies for creating a productive arts ecology. And then there's the Culture Plan B podcast featuring work of artists and communities who create culture outside the big institutions. These are all about democratizing and rebalancing arts and cultural policy and their distribution of funding. They're, they're seeking to remove the barriers that thwart or waste creative potential. And they are addressing the issue of what exactly is obsolete in the current climate, which does have to be addressed. I think it's here in these kind of ventures that the crown jewels are to be found. That will ensure that there is biodiversity in arts and culture, that we need to navigate through the rocky uncharted territory of the new arts normal ahead of us. Brilliant, thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, negotiated relationships uh, is very interesting. My ears picked up then. And uh, biodiversity in ecologies is also very helpful, I think. You see ecology around a lot at the moment. Um, you can have an undiverse ecology for sure. Um, Alice, are you there? If you say hello, Alice. Hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> do you have slides, Alice? I don't have them, I'm afraid. I have no slides, um, but I do have a link to the publication that I'm just going to share in the chat. Okay, brilliant. There, there was no uh, request for you to have slides. Talking is equally as good. Okay, just fire away whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, so I'm an artist, curator and writer based in Halifax. Um, and I run um, a property event called Art Lab that started off at Dean Clough, um, which has now moved online to Zoom, which is all about peer support, um, artist presentations and uh, supporting artists. I'm also um, a co-founder of Dwell Time, the uh, arts publication reflecting on mental well-being. And I was the writer in residence for the publication I've just put in the chat, which is called Resilience is Futile, um, which was a corridor race and wise and collaboration looking at um, this term resilience that's banded around in the art world what is resilience how are artists resilient and investigating those kind of things um, so my methodology was to ask my peer support um, network so art lab and a couple of other networks who they recommended as a resilient artist and then i went to talk to the artists about their practice so they were already defined by their peers as being resilient they didn't have to justify that all they had to do is tell me how how they made it work for themselves, their practice, um, and how um, how that worked for them, what networks they were involved in. Um, and then I wrote up the, the process and the piece in uh, the, the publication that I've linked to. Um, and that was a really interesting uh, kind of case study, qualitative kind of research, looking at six individual art practices, as well as a studio group as well, sorry, seven, seven practices, including a studio group and how they make it work and all the things they navigate like the precariousness of income um, and finding space and maintaining you know mutually beneficial um, relationships with other artists and institutions all sorts of interesting stuff um, and off the back of that um, with well time we're now looking at revisiting those artists and talking to them about the impact of COVID-19 on their practices and their mental well-being so this is a, a wide band commission collaboration with real time um, that we're going to be shortly publicising. I think we've, we've sent the press, press release out recently, but we'll be uploading the podcast soon. Um, and those are picking up on the conversations that I already had through the writer and residency programme for the Resilience is Futile publication. So finding out what's changed for them, how they've navigated the changes and what impact it's had on them. Um, so completely diverse, as you'd expect, with different diverse practices and everybody's been impacted differently through this process. Um, and that will hopefully pave the way for some more kind of in-depth research as well into what's going on with artists in, in, um, in these times. And, you know, hopefully some, um, some common things that are emerging about what's useful, what's not useful, 
So it's right at the early stages of this kind of R&D process, um, building on some previous work I did. Um, and uh, if you're interested, I can drop some art lab meeting info into the chat as well, because we've got our next one tonight at eight o'clock um, and everybody's welcome to join, all active practitioners come and um, join in with that. So I think that's probably a, a quick overview of everything that you, that you asked me to talk about. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We can always come back to you anyway. But yeah, do put the um, do put the links in the chat. I didn't realise it was tonight, but of course it's the first Monday, isn't it? So okay, perfect. All right, put that in the chat. Um, and if you get a chance to get a hold of that um, book, Resilience is Futile. It's actually a really good read. I think um, I got through it in no time. I read it cover to cover. I thought it was great. So uh, if people want to download that, the the actual physical paper copy is is lovely. I don't know if can people still buy that or are they still around. Alice? Oh. Um, I'm not sure if, if there's any stock left. If there's two, no. you know. No, there's, there's probably about 10 copies left. They're very, very uh, desirable. But yeah. it's on the PDF. Go to YVAM website and you can download it from there. It is a lovely design. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Alice will put, the, um, put those links in the chat. Uh, thank you both. That was a fantastic start. Um, we're not going to have Q&A as such, but if people have got questions specifically for the speakers, either Susan or Alice or anyone who speaks subsequently, just put that in the chat and just put question for however, you know, question for whoever and then um, direct it to them and people can try and answer as we go along. Um, we're going to have about half an hour, I think, for sort of contributions and discussions. Uh, the most straightforward way to do that, as I say, is to do the Zoom hand up thing and I will call on people more or less in the order that they do that. Uh, so to do the hand up, you go to participants, then click on your name and then more. I think that's the way to do it. Uh, there might be something in the uh, bar down at the bottom as well. Um, okay, great. Um, Hansa Kadim, you've had your hand up right from the start. Um, if people could be brief, especially uh, responsibility on early speakers to kind of set a good precedent. So talk for about two minutes, uh, any perspective that you want to put in. Um, I think that's about it. So Hansa, if you want to just unmute yourself and then we'll go you first and then Tiffany uh, Holloman, you next. Right, hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, I can. Um, I think, Susan, I read your paper and I really do agree with it. And I'd also just like to say, do you know, Alice has been working very tirelessly and I've seen her sort of, my practice has uh, kind of flourished because of her. And the three pieces I want to talk about is um, the organisations is Brig House Arts Festival, um, artworks, and they work with the Peace Hall, they did hashtag Here I Am Refugee Week and Basement Arts. Um, and I think I'd really want to say, you know, how Alice doesn't sort of do herself justice in that she's really sort of been that beacon of the North. And I've seen it really, truly. Um, she's, she's just doing it. I mean, I can't do what she's doing and I'm just very selfish. I think I've learned to be selfish. But to add note for 11 years, to add to what Susan was saying, I did work in the community through um, Age UK, schools, foster homes. But it's an... It's an individuals initiative you have to lead it and so the pandemic has been a double-edged sword it stabbed the arts in the heart but um, for the home workers and the carers it's been that kind of given them that shine and that's my here painting love and hope painting which has had a little bit of success and I think that's about as much I can say Andy for now <laughs> without stuttering and bumbling through it uh, no, that was perfect, and, and thank you for putting together such a nice uh, Zoom background. Hansa said, oh, I've put together a special Zoom background, and I thought she meant one of those fancy, um, you know, the thing you can do on Zoom, but th that's much nicer. Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, Tiffany, um, if you just want to unmute yourself, and uh, yeah, where you go. Hello, um, hello, everyone. Susan, I wanted to say that I was impressed by your paper but and what I found intriguing is that when you mentioned the rebooting and rebooting the way we think about 
contri- how our artists contribute to us and how we can make sure their livelihoods are taken care of, I found myself thinking about UBI, which is universal basic income. And I say this because most of technology or capitalism is driven by technology. It has been. However, when it comes to the arts, our technology has remained the same. We always have to have stages. We always need to worry about acoustics. Our technology doesn't necessarily change lighting and all of this. And therefore, like you said, because we're at the trickle down economies of the world, we don't get what we should. And so I think universal basic income is a way of rebooting that view. Now, I don't know maybe if we could bridge some sort of devolution regional maybe basic income rather than universal but i think it's a way somewhere a scene to start i should say as far as mayoral candidates and bringing forth the possibility of having a regional basic income to secure the poet the artist the visual artists everyone the actors and actresses and ensure that they have well-being to flourish because I noticed that in studies on universal basic income one of the main things that came out of it was an increase of well-being which I also noticed that you focused on so maybe we can have a bridge there and like I said just putting out there for a thought about the future and how we can work this out thank you Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I definitely wanted to get UBI into this. Um, There are a couple of people who um, are writing hand up in the chat and I am going to get to you, Paul Digby and Andrew Cooper. Just let me uh, get my head around this properly. So thank you very much, Tiffany, for UBI. Somebody from Calderdale UBI Labs said that they were going to join this. If you did, and you wanted to either post some UBI links in the chat or say a little bit about what it is uh, in the video, that would be fantastic. Uh, Jack Simpson, if you're there, after the next couple of speakers, I'd also be interested in getting um, the capability approach sort of read into the record. Um, That's putting you on the spot slightly to just explain what that is, but I think it goes really nicely with UBI, um, and so that might be really helpful. Sue, I would like to ask you what you think about UBI, but um, I think first Andrew Cooper and then um, Paul Digby, I think uh, you wanted to speak. So we'll have both of you, Paul, if I've got that right. Um, Um, Andrew Andrew Cooper first. Uh, You're very welcome to say what your relationship to this process is, Andrew, and then... Okay. uh, (laughs) Well, I'm I'm a candidate for West Yorkshire Mayor, Um, so um, I think I'm the only one who's been picked so far, so um, I'm the the Green Party's uh, candidate, and uh, so I was really pleased to hear about UBI, uh, because UBI is is one of our policies, and I'm not going to do a big party political broadcast for the Green Party, because there there are other parties who are beginning to take an interest in it as well, uh, which is encouraging. Um, There was a motion passed at Leeds Council, which had broad support actually from Labour and Lib Dems and Greens so that that was that was positive to see and the Lib Dems are beginning to say some nice things about um, base income as well so so it may be an idea that's times come we've had it for 20 odd years and and, and uh, there are some real enthusiasts who talk a lot about it and I can obviously see the, the benefit to artists and to, to people who want to get involved in the arts but actually that's not what I wanted to talk about in many ways I, I think One of the things that uh, interests me a lot is town centres and uh, city centres and and, and the changes that are actually happening there. We're seeing, obviously, uh, online shopping, uh, the closure of shops, um, a reshaping how people are actually looking at town centres. And I think that leads to a huge space uh, for the arts and uh, and the, the regeneration of town centres as as places that people value and places that people want to go to requires a huge injection uh, of uh, activity in the arts. Uh, and one of the things I've been really fortunate uh, doing uh, over the last four years is I've gone to a lot of European countries looking at 
at what they do uh, and they're a lot better at it i've got to say in some places that, than we are I, I remember seeing one roundabout in sweden with a huge um 50 foot high pinocchio striding across this roundabout and i thought crikey i wonder if we get i wonder if they get that through in huddersfield um <laughs> i can think of a few councillors who wouldn't be too happy about that but i i, I i'm very keen on bravery and uh, and courage in terms of the arts and some great stuff going on in huddersfield so um yeah i i do get what's been said about devolution um, of uh, of the arts and giving more power to local authorities but that's not just for the local authorities that's actually for the the artistic community below that and having some direct input uh, and uh, and governance from the arts community so I'll, I'll leave it at that but um, yeah great to hear what everybody else is talking about here smashing thank you Andrew and um, we did another uh, session like this about homes and livable places and something that came through quite strongly from that was um, just collecting together good examples uh, from Europe, from the UK, anywhere else. It's actually a really powerful technique to just to be able to point to stuff. So that's great. Um, so Sue Ball um, and Jack, I don't know, uh, Sue, do you want to go first on levelling up and then Jack, if you're there, I might then ask you about capability approach. So Sue first on levelling up, yeah? Yeah, I mean, just responding really to Sue, just in terms about how resilient artists are and that whole sort of notion, that sort of fiction of the artist being incredibly resilient, that uh, YVAN, uh, as part of the CVAN network, did a survey with over a thousand uh, visual artists this year. And 92% said they were in assistance because of the pandemic. This is particularly in the face of COVID, but 20% of artists weren't able to access and not eligible for any of the current support schemes. So I think artists are really very vulnerable at the minute. Um, I think also it's quite interesting because I think in the face of COVID, I think there is a lot more local networking and support. I mean, it's, it's gone back to the local, which I think is really important to consider now if we're making a case for West Yorkshire. Um, and the role of those particular artists and visual arts spaces at a local level are pretty much vital to their cultural life. So I think there's a, I think there's, there's some good arguments to be made now in terms of like working at that local level and arguments particularly in case in response to COVID in terms of the role of the artists. Um, I think there's also, there's a hyper local level, but there's also a very high sort of economic uh, governmental level. The visual arts are still not, part of any government economic plan uh, and that is a real problem for us they're not considered both in terms of the benefit of the arts eco economically to the to the country um, so there's no sort of uh, investment or there's no status with the arts i think there's so there's a very sort of hyper governmental level that we need to work at but there's also like the relationship of the arts at a hyper local or local level. I think there's this particular idea of the mayor can actually work on both those levels. Very welcome it. Yeah, thank you. I was I was just thinking that as you were talking that 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 particular role, whatever you think of that mayoral structure, it, it does seem to be quite it works, it certainly seems to be working in Greater Manchester as someone who can bridge those two scales. Yeah. Um, getting getting back to the very local, we were having a a discussion well something that i've come across through this pr amp process is this idea of 15 minute neighborhoods i think there's some really interesting stuff around um artists within 15 minute neighborhoods uh jack if you don't mind um say so if you could say something about um capability yeah, of course growth, first of yeah, all that would be brilliant. no problem i mean i mean one thing i'd say just before that is andy you and i have talked about this kind of principle of subsidiarity i'm sure other people have come across it but um it's one of the guiding principles of the eu and is the idea that decisions should be made at the lowest level that they can efficiently be made at right so so transport decisions made for yorkshire um you know arts budgeting things like this and i think that within the spirit of devolution is the sense that power should be held locally um and so i think that's probably something that the arts community could take and say well look 
part of the kind of raison d'etre of what is happening here is the sense that power shouldn't be consolidated in the hands of a small amount of people. And therefore, look, if that's a good enough reason to have this election, that's a good enough reason to check out how power is dispersed within Yorkshire. So that's one thing I'd just say first. So yeah, on the capability approach. So the capability approach is this framework that I use in, in my research. And, and it basically is, is a framework that's used to challenge the idea that GDP or standard kind of economic models are a good way of evaluating how a society is doing. So you can have all kinds of societies that are doing well. The US has a, you know, in many ways, a kind of good economy, but whether it's a great place to live right now. <laughs> um, and so I was, I, was, I was on a panel with um, someone quite senior at the council and we got into a really interesting discussion, I think, when we were talking to a lot of people in music and culture and she said, look, we've embedded culture within the economic policy of the city. We've done this great thing. And, and I said, well, look, if we just look at the language that we're using here, it sounds like we're saying culture is important in so long as it is economically important. Um, and I think whilst ever we use language like that, and I, you know, in my, a few years ago when I was more involved with the kind of 2023 process, we'd have these, um, I mean, amazing projects, great people. And we'd go through a two hour long meeting talking about all kinds of really interesting things and the role of culture in well-being and all this and that. But still it felt like we had to funnel it into the language, standard economic language. And I, and I understand why people feel the pressure to do that. I think that one thing that's maybe missing, I, I know Leeds much better than I know the rest of the region, um, but it's the, the kind of elephant in the room really is that until we challenge this kind of meta narrative as to what the role of culture is in the region and what role it plays in Leeds, um, until we have those conversations openly, then, then I, I think we will always be judged by things like what kind of economic value you bring. Um, and, and artists and people in culture are just never going to win like that because, uh, you know, one of the things that in this discussion, the head of assets for the council came back and said, well, look, it's just much easier to measure economic things. So it got into a bit of a kind of flustered discussion between the two of us. But yeah, if, if, you, want to, if you want to explain why having really nice murals in an area is nice or really taking care of things in, you know, East Leeds or whatever, like, of course, you're not going to win if a property developer can just very easily put things into kind of standard economic language. And that's the thing that will always trump any other kind of um, lived experience of the world. So I think as creatives, like we can have these micro battles, but unless we're kind of saying, look, there is something much more important than is often used in our sense of what culture and what societies are about. I think, I think we're fighting a losing battle. I think that's the thing that when we look to mayoral candidates, we need to understand, are these the kind of people that understand that culture has a role that is equally important, if stranger to describe sometimes, <laughs> as economic outcomes? Um, and I think if they don't get that, then I, I don't think they should get the backing of culture in the city or in the region. Brilliant. I, I liked meta-narrative, but I also really like stranger to describe. I mean, that's that there's, but there's, there's loads of really interesting stuff to dig into in that. Um, that was fantastic, thank you. I may come back to you at the end just to ask you particularly about the small kind of arts organisations which are spaces, so your experience of Hyde Park Book Club, so that we just talk about those kind of little, as well as people, we also talk about those grassroots spaces as well. But I'm just going to move on a little bit because there's a couple of people who um, have put their hands up now. Um, Lisa Malligan first, and then Mardi Ansari after that. Um, but we'll give you a minute, Jack, just so we get that in the um, read into the record. So Lisa first, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Lisa. I run Bradford Producing Hub. Um, so all of this is really interesting to me because it's it's exactly what Bradford Producing Hub has been set up to do. So really, I mean, it, it comes down from the Arts Council, but the initiative to, to pilot and test out what it means to devolve power making to and funding and um, decisions from an artist's need, an artist led perspective in a place. So Bradford Producing Hub um, has an investment of one and a half million pounds from the Arts Council over four years to test out all of these things to kind of go actually you know, starting from what we're hearing artists need and responding to that and making sure it's delivered. Um, we also sit on part of the cultural recovery group in Bradford. So going back to what was being said earlier about, you know, recovery in cities and how we respond locally. So it's just, it's a fascinating time. And I think it's important for people to know that 
um, the producing hub started as, as what the Arts Council actually called performing arts hubs. So it is live arts focused. It doesn't include, sadly, um, visual arts on its own. However, of course, live arts can't happen without visual arts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it all absolutely crosses over. Um, and I think as part of this, you know, case for West Yorkshire and what the West Yorkshire Mayor looks like, certainly from the, my experience of running this project for the first year and responding to those absolutely kind of grassroots level artist needs, I can only see a case for this kind of model being needed in all the cities in the UK. I think it is already proving to work and proving to be really, really essential. I guess my fear with, with the kind of West Yorkshire concept is that you, you could almost lose that really specific place-based stuff and how we don't kind of go that level up too high and, and actually manage to, to really stay specifically place-based as well. So I guess I would just um, say to everybody, you know, please feel free to get in touch and get involved with Producing Hub. There are only two Producing Hubs in the country. So in terms of, again, you know, where West Yorkshire's position in this, we're, we're really rare. We're, we're really lucky to have this kind of pilot going on and this test to see what the impact actually is on, on supporting artists from that, from that um, needs led and yeah, devolved power. It's, it's fascinating, but already challenging in terms of some of the expectations from the larger organizations, from the boulders with a U. Um, <laughs> looking, looking on it going, you know, well, where's the big and shiny? And so I've spent the first year kind of pushing back on the big and shiny, the stuff that Jack was saying about Leeds 2023, they rightly so have an agenda of big and shiny. You know, they need to do that. They need to, it's a festival. Um, so I think it's really interesting to take away all those layers of wanting to show off and wanting to kind of be big and go, actually, what happens when you, when you really start on an individual perspective? And then let's see where we get to in a few years. Can I put in and ask a question? Just because how, that's a really good model. And you're talking about like the local and it being like the needs of Leeds is very different to the needs of Bradford. They're very different to the needs of Huddersfield. But how do you make change on a bigger scale and influence bigger things without it naturally growing to be too big for its boots? Like how do you keep it local and, and then also influence massive yeah. like mental mm -hmm. policy like whatever you want how how i don't know if you know an answer but <laughs> it's one of the things we're definitely testing i don't know the answer yet but it's a big challenge because obviously we want bradford to influence everywhere else and we want everywhere else to influence bradford but we want to make sure that what we're doing is first and foremost about people who have that really strong connection to bradford and then hopefully it'll grow out and beyond but yeah it's a really good question and i don't know yet Susan, Jones, it looked like you wanted to respond to that. Thank you, Lisa. That was fantastic. Um, I'll, I'll just go straight on to Susan. I did write some notes down from that, but I'll just move on, I think. Thank you. Susan, Jones, it looked like you just were... Going to Sorry, I was just unmuting. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to make a point that it's not always about getting starting something off small and then getting it bigger and then finding you've created a monster you know, that uh, we have to get over this notion that development is serial and means getting bigger or having more of them. It, you have to recognise that it's about as much about scaling down as scaling up. And it's as much about um, recognising that something is good at a particular time, but has had its day, whether it's a small artist run or something else if it's lost its mission so i would just generally caution against those kind of like here's a model that works let's have more of those brilliant thank you and i think that is a, that's a really interesting uh thing about which does connect to this idea of subsidiarity about keeping place specificity um, and decisions being made at the right uh scale um which was what lisa was talking about and also that it's interesting, the relationships of big and shiny. So, um, Mardia uh, Ansari next, and then Paul Digby after that, and then I need to have a think about what to do for the last 10 minutes after that. So, Mardia first, and then Paul, if you're ready after that. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, um, Andrew. Um, thanks, Susan. I, um, a lot of what you said um, really resonates with me. Um, 
My name is Medeha and I run the Cultural Ecology Project out of Bradford and currently um, it's actually really good that I get to speak after Lisa because uh, Bradford Producing Hub um, are working very closely with us to develop a, um, a training, a skills training course that is aimed at um, women arts practitioners from diverse backgrounds. The provocation that I would like to make today um, is thinking about diversity in leadership um, because I think the um, current cultural ecology um, in West Yorkshire, by the way, I am from Kirklees. I'm, I live in Dewsbury, but work in Bradford. Um, so I, I just mentioning this because I can take a sort of wider, um, wider uh, perspective on things. Um, I feel like um, our communities are not necessarily homogenous. So our cultural activities can't be homogenous. We need to definitely think about representation. Um, if we look at the participants of this particular meeting as well, you can see how underrepresented we are um, in, in ethnic diversity. And it's not because there aren't enough people to represent or to lead or um, to advocate. It's just, I feel like the cultural ecology is not, um, what's the word? It doesn't, it, it's not, um, it, it's not, we're not doing something right. Uh, something is not right. Um, and I find that at a lot of um, sort of decision making tables, um, at a lot of policy making um, tables, uh, you know, such as this meeting today, um, I find that I am usually the only person um, who holds a diverse identity like this. So it's just, we don't have the answer. Um, I don't think we'll have the answer or a solution for this, but it's just a provocation that I would like all of you to think about, about the, um, the, diver the sort of maybe a need for investment in um, leadership training um, of people from diverse backgrounds, arts practitioners from diverse backgrounds. Um, thank you, Andrew. And um, yeah, hello to, I can see that some um, fellow colleagues and friends are always, um, all, also here. And it's really nice to um, be here. Thank you, Andrew. Smashing, thank you. And I think maybe you suggested the, what the thing should be, which is at least partly is investment in leadership. Um, so Paul and then Sahail Khan, if you're still interested in speaking, um, so you'll be next but one. Uh, so Paul Digby first. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, Paul Digby, Leeds Based Artists. I've got three projects I'm going to uh, plug with details in the chat as well. Um, I, one is at Leeds Museum, that's from tomorrow. It's uh, four mosaics made by myself. Uh, we're working with Leeds Dementia Services, funded by Leeds Inspired. Uh, I've got another exhibition at the end of the month at the Corn Exchange with seven Leeds artists responding to the city. And, and then also I'm working on a larger Atkinson Grimshaw project with Leeds 23 um, as a partner, Scarborough Art Gallery, uh, Bridewell Studios in Liverpool, uh, and my friend, uh, colleague, Jonathan Turner and I are working on this project based on Victorian painter Atkinson Grimshaw. If you don't know his work, it's well worth a look. Thank you very much. Smashing, thank you. Um, just hang on one second, Sir Hale. So we're sort of coming up to time. Susan, uh, if I were to sort of give you the last two minutes to just to respond, would you want to do that or uh, no? Okay, fine. All right, so, so what we might do is just go through until two o'clock and then stop. <laughs> so Sir Hale, do you, wanna, do you wanna dive in and then we'll see where we get to after that? Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself, mate, I think. Uh, okay. I can't hear you at the moment. Here we go. Can you hear me? We can now, yeah. Go on. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wrote a lot, <laughs> but I think a lot of people have actually touched on the things that I wanted to say, really. I mean, speaking as an artist um, and as a freelancer, um, especially what Susan had to say, and also Sue, really um, touched on the things that I wanted to cover. I wanted to just get back about, I think for me, I think in terms of the mayoral offer, I think a lot of what that work could be, could be about connecting. And I think there's lots of things going on in this region and they need to broker those relationships, I would say, 
between all those different organizations and, and all the various small organizations and big organizations get coming together to be able to network. That could be hosted by NPOs. That could be hosted by institutions, academic institutions. Making an open invitation where the mayor was present to enable people to come together and speak about their concerns as artists. And I think the case for diversity is a really key one, but it's one that's kind of been, I mean, I've been involved in the arts since I was 17 and I've recently been unwell for about two years. So I've not been in the working environment at all. So I've been able to kind of take a step back and kind of lose my self interest as a kind of person who's always climbing up the, the face of trying to get work, trying to make work, trying to connect. And I think one of the things is to allow people that space to begin to have these conversations. But I can't really, I don't want to go on because I think a lot of people have already spoken to that. But I would say in terms of diversity, coming back to that, what's important is diversity means lots of different things. I mean, lots means lots of different things for me personally. Um, and I think sometimes we need to really look at what that means when we talk about diverse. That could be a, a working class lad who likes to do graffiti who's not got the voice or the expression to be able to engage on that. So there's a lot of things that we need to unpack around this. And I think this is a really useful process. Um, and I think just lastly, my parting shot would be, I think for them that have, they need to give more. To them that have budgets and money, NPOs, academic institutions, large organizations, they need to come and be sitting around this table and be involved in those, those, those people who are getting them the million and a half pound budgets. They need to be more proactive, not being in their silos. Even if they're about networking a little bit, they've got a certain remit. They need to extend out of that remit and they need to be the ones because they're the ones that have. So they're the ones that need to give. And that includes the people who talk about leadership as well and leadership voices and advocates. They need to do that as well. And I think a lot of people do, but I think that's where they really need to start to engage because otherwise, as artists, as the freelancers, we're kind of stuffed and we are stuffed and we're gonna be more stuffed. So that's, I'll leave that with that. Thank you. That was fantastic. So I agree. Yes, thank you. Um, very much about the um, that the potential of that mayoral job as one that's making connections, um, and also it's just we were just five minutes early with that. If that had been bang on two o'clock, <laughs> <laughs> um, you might have to put yourself back on mute now. Um, Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, do you want to just say something about the the sort of where arts organisations, which are small venues, are at, Jack? So. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and, and just to tap into what Sail was saying there, there was, um, so, so that period, there was a, you know, I know it's great Abigail's joined us here and having 2023 here, because I, I think that could be a real project that, that does some of the things that, that we want to do, really. And uh, the kind of predecessors to this iteration, I think, to Leanne um, Buchan and, and a couple of other people, really, I mean, I remember getting calls from them I didn't know. I didn't know them. Just going. Can we just go for a coffee and just hear what you think is going on that's interesting? And I was like, wow. I was like, this is real radical. I mean, it's kind of radical democracy, right? There are representatives, and they're coming to us and saying, you tell us what you think is worthwhile. So, you know, I think in in the twenty twenty three process, we have a potential kind of vessel that that has done some of this, and it was incredible to get together with a hundred people, uh, you know, regularly in meetings in our subgroups. Um, to, to, to just openly discuss these things. But yeah, in terms of on small, small groups, and I think, Rasheen, you were saying, you know, how, how do we keep, um, you know, things coming from the bottom up? And definitely, I, I, I find with, and I, this has been a learning process, I didn't begin like this, but, you know, in le learning from other managers and, and leaders, um, is do, do you have a commitment to listen to everybody? I think it begins with, do you even think that's valuable? So for me, the 18, 19 year olds that work at the book club, I'm like, they will see things I don't see. And, and that is kind of valid in a way. So I think part of it is just a philosophical point of view in your organization. You know, do you just think that um, everybody has some kind of something to add, add here? Um, and yeah, you know, Andy, you know, you, you and I were talking about the talk that I gave at the Corn Exchange. And lots of it was about really that lots of people in the city, I think, or in the region have ideas and have, have skills, but they just don't really have the resources to fail, really. When you look at, let, let's take out the Leeds Uni students and lots of the kind of more middle class settlers in the city. When we look at lots of the city is working class and low middle class, and they don't have 400 quid to, 
to put on an event that might go wrong. So I think some of it is kind of real low level, like giving people space and giving people resources. And that is something that a city with, you know, a financial district like we've got here, uh, you know, we, if we can have Jet2 and Skybase here, we can give a kid from Seacroft 400 quid to do a mural. Like, I mean, all day long we can do that. So, so yeah, I think, you know, it's, all the answers are kind of there. It's just us working out the vessels, you know, like the 2023 process of, of a few years ago, working out what are these vessels that we can um, do them with. Because I think lots of us know what we want, really, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's um, a very sh a shrewd thing to point out, that maybe, maybe we do, maybe it's just a question of gathering together the things that we know should happen based on the expertise that we've got collectively this afternoon and going beyond this, and then saying that in the right kind of a way. Um, and finally just say as well sorry just but also working in good faith you know that whether it's the playhouse northern ballet you know yorkshire dance like I, th I think in the right atmosphere where people don't feel threatened we all want to work together but i think sometimes it can become this kind of you know you hear that somebody's got a bit of a grant or this and that and you know we we think that we're not on the same side so part of it as us all as loads of cultural leaders here is how do you create environments where people don't feel in competition with each other? Yes, that is a very good point. And I am a little bit guilty of being too adversarial sometimes as well. So I, that's something for me to remember personally. Um, I've got three minutes to go. <laughs> does, does anyone... yes, Susan, Susan Jones uh, put something really interesting in the chat about the role of institutions um, and how they can be responsive and how we can maybe change the structures and frameworks uh which might be an interesting thing to end on the piece i put in the chat was actually posed to me by somebody doing the program of activity for reset they said do you think there is a useful role for institutions given that they aren't financially viable with the models that they've been led to believe and encouraged to develop. Um, you know, if they can't get, get enough subsidy and they can't get enough earned income, what, what, what happens to them? Do, do, we have, uh, do we have an image of Detroit in our heads when we think of these things where former industrial powerhouses have trees growing up through them and uh, areas of agriculture of, of, uh, of post-industrial areas now being used to grow vegetables and so on for local communities that we have got um, an extraordinarily expensive uh, for the times ahead certain kind of infrastructure aided and abetted by copious amounts of national lottery funding which has come from the pockets of uh, people who don't necessarily participate in the arts and that's another argument but uh, you know it, we will always end up with a tiny bit to a lesser or greater degree for individuals if we continue to say that the infrastructure that we have is the infrastructure that we want for the 21st century Brilliant, thank you. I'm, I'm almost tempted to say that that's the that's it. Uh, that was perfect and all pretty much bang on time as well. So, and that's an interesting question. What's the what's the infrastructure? I mean, infrastructure isn't everything because that implies bricks and mortar and things like that. But the connections between people and and how what kinds of infrastructure facilitate those connections and things like that. A lot uh, more about the community infrastructure, though, isn't it? And how it works physically in buildings, in spaces, and then with things like this and people in virtual spaces and how they coexist, isn't it? Yeah, 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 completely. So what are the, what are the infrastructures that, that do that? Okay, that's bang on three o'clock. We have a sort of principle of, of finishing these things pretty much um, spot on time so that you know um, how much time you're giving up by joining us. Um, so next steps are very quickly, I will post the uh, chat, not anything that was sent privately in the chat, but the, because um, it seems like I can, I've not been able to keep my eye on it, but it seems like there's loads of interesting stuff in there. And I will post the video recording as well. And then I will do this kind of breaking it down into themes. Um, it, it's been a really rich discussion. Um, 
with you know getting from practicalities of individual artist practice to to political theory which has been lovely um and so there'll be loads to go on from this so i will it'll take me a while to do that because i try and transcribe more or less everything but that will be that then after that it will be um who would like to be involved and what are the next steps which we will we'll facilitate that um anything that i have missed rasheen do you think um apart from the amazing success of the thing that we did on monday that you could talk about um and how we're changing or trying to adapt to how the world is now with the events and giving people a bit of a platform to speak which is quite i think that's worth sharing what what was that gone <laughs> the, <laughs> walk, <laughs> the walk on um the walk on monday oh last monday yes sorry um, not, not, yeah. today. <laughs> not today. Um, yes, yeah, so, so um, we yes. think we, same skies have started. Actually, yes, thank you. That's a really good point. So same skies have started um, inviting people to host us for little walks where they show us round places. And we did a really nice one um, in Bradford with Jane from Roosadin, who are a community group in somewhere called Allerton, and um, Warren Hussein, who's the Greens deputy mayoral candidate, and we had a lovely walk and got loads and loads of interesting information. So if anyone actually who uh, would like to show us, invite us to go uh, have a walk and to talk about wherever you are, um, that would be very welcome. Uh, we're up for doing loads of those and it's really straightforward. We just turn up and go for a walk and have a chat and document it a bit. Um, so that's a nice next step if anyone would like to do that. Um, and then beyond that, um, yeah, post, we'll post the documentation, then a little bit of uh, thinking about what that looks like grouped together. And um, anyone who would like to be involved, just um, get in touch at any point, including through the chat. Uh, we've got until next May to do this. So how are we going to influence the person who gets the job? Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Alice. Thanks all the contributors. That was fantastic. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Rasheen. Cheers, folks. See you later.